Uh, we're, we're in this series walking through the book of Romans. This is a little odd for me. Normally, kind of my normal sermon series is three, four, five weeks. Uh, we're looking at the book of Romans. I don't know how far into the book of Romans we'll go, but we're in like week five or six now, and we're in chapter three. So, so we're just kind of walking our way through. I appreciate your attention span. Uh, the reason why we're doing this, it's very clear. Okay, it's very clear. There are a lot of things that we Christians, especially in America, in our churches, there are a lot of things that we like to grasp onto for identity. Like this is who, this is the kind of church we go to, you know? We grasp onto denominational names, right? That gives clarity as to kind of who we are and who we're friends with. And we grasp on, goodness, it depends on who you talk to, some grasp onto like translations of the Bible, you know, or we grasp onto music style, right? We grasp onto uh, to pianos and organs, or we grasp onto drums and guitars. You know, we, we like grasp onto that and say, that's, that's who we are right there. We grasp, uh, uh, you know, dress codes, you know, and, and we're going to have, you know, this kind of outfit that we wear. In fact, only in America are there church clothes. Like, that's the only place in the world where, where that, that's part of our faith. We grasp onto that and say, that's who we are. And, I, and honestly, this is not a message about whether or not those are good or bad things. I think there are probably some good and bad in all of that. But the reality is that if we ultimately want to do the will of God in the way of God, then we will grasp onto what the Bible calls the gospel. We will grasp onto what the scripture tells us is good news. And that will always win. Like the gospel will always be the most important thing to us. And ultimately, I, this sounds like it's just language and words, but it's not. It's more than that. We have to become a church where when someone says, tell me about the potter's house, the first thing that comes to your mind is not that we meet in a gymnasium or sit on comfy seats. It's not that we have, you know, like sometimes basketball goals in the gym. It's not that we have a great band or a great choir. It's not that our pastor never wears a tie. It's not any of that stuff. That's not our identity. Our identity is in the gospel. Does that make sense? Our identity is in what Jesus started to do, continues to do, and is going to end up doing through us. And ultimately, all of those other things, all of that other stuff that we grasp onto, denominational heritage, Bible translation, dress code, music style, that kind of stuff, all of that ought to depend on the gospel. And all of that ought to be driven by the gospel. And we ought to know if we grasp onto a dress code, if we grasp onto a music style, if we grasp on to a style of building, we ought to know why the gospel led us to do that. And if we can't, then it's just a preference. You see what I'm saying? If we can't tell somebody why our music style is gospel driven, then our music style doesn't matter. If we can't tell somebody why our dress code is gospel driven, then our go our, our, as far as I'm concerned, our dress code gets in the way of the gospel. See what I'm saying? So we have to make sure that it's the focus. And, and I say that kind of, you know, with the intention of making sure we all get that. You see, God is all about hitting the target, like having a target and hitting the target. If you read the entire scriptures, you're going to find it over and over and over that God is about targets. Uh, and, and he's not about like shooting the arrow and wherever it lands, run up to it, paint a target around it. That's not what he's doing, right? Sometimes we like it that way. Like, this is how it ended up, so that must be how God wanted it. Like, we'll, we'll just shoot the target wherever it ends, paint the target around that. that that's not it. Uh, God is about picking a target before we shoot, you know, before we aim, recognizing the target, and then going after it. And if we hit it, praise God. And if we miss it, confession. In fact, did you know that the definition of sin, the one used, the word for sin used in the New Testament most, the definition for sin means missing the mark. It, it's a... It's a word used in archery and targeting, so that ultimately means I miss the target, right? So what I thought I might do is have a little fun with this. So I'm going to make sure that you remember this. I brought a few things with me, uh, a few target-related things. I might need some help with a couple of these things. Uh, I tell you what, Mr. Roger, would you mind helping me with something here? Uh, now, the good news is uh, the fact that I'm asking you to help me now means you're not one of the people I'm going to embarrass, Okay, so, which begs the question, is he going to embarrass someone? Yes. Okay, so, so what we're going to do is move this, if you don't mind, I'll grab this in. This is just a, it's just a thing that I've had in my garage for a little while. It's just a, it's just a putting green. You know, it's just about, you know, and I hear, I can't remember, I think we have some people in the church who play golf, I think, and I'm sure they're pretty good at hitting the target. That, that's all I need, my friend. I appreciate it. You guys give Mr. Roger a hand. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
And, and we, have, we, have, uh, we have some more things back here, and I'm even going to bring some out tonight because this sermon is 50% this morning and 50% this evening. But uh, let me think, who is it among us who plays golf? Um, I know there are a few. I, I think maybe Corey Carter plays golf. I think maybe he does. Is that right, Corey? Do you play golf? And I think, wait a second, wait a second, let's see. There's, the, there's a last name. It's coming to mind. There's a last name. It's Brian Henson. That He plays golf. Brian, here's the deal. I'm a little scared of Sherry. I'm not bringing her up here. I'm a little... You know, my daddy was a teacher. Yeah, I'm not messing with a teacher. I'm just not going to do it. So come here, Corey and Brian. I need your help with this. Uh, now, here's the, the fun thing is you guys should do this. Yes. The, the, here's the fun thing. The fact that I'm calling them now means that they're not the people I'm going to embarrass the most. So, so this, is, see, this is simple. I'm just going to, I mean, this is a real easy thing. Basically, if you make the putt, if you make the putt, it just goes in the thing and it comes out the other side. So, I mean, that's, you can hear it, right? See, that's it. I mean, it's that simple. So I have three golf balls here. I'm just, I just thought I'd go ahead and use, I rigged the game because I brought my putter. <laughs> so I don't know if I can hit this or not. I mean, I really am not sure. But I'm going to try, and, I, and honestly, I have not been practicing. I, have, I haven't gotten this out and tried to make sure I hit it every time or anything like that. But the goal, if you remember, the goal is to, is to hit the putt, you know, is to make the, make the putt. And, and so that's my, see, there you go. Your response, there you, that's awesome. And so, Corey, you're up next, man. I mean, I just want to see, can we, can we hit the mark, you know? Can we do this? <laughs> That was right on. That was right on. Copycat. Copycat. <laughs> Thank you very much, fellas. I appreciate it. Okay, they outsmarted me. Maybe we should say that I'm going to embarrass myself. Maybe that's what we're going to do. The next game, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of games when it comes to targets. So a lot of things you can do, you know, to try and make sure that you hit the target. Uh, but I try, I try to pick out one that I thought, you know, would, would just deal with the, I don't know, maybe the love and the joy that comes from being a part of a church and, 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 then, and marriages and family. And so there's a lot of good stuff like this. And I thought about, you know, what about darts? Uh, anybody throw darts here? So, I mean, this is just basically a dart board. We're going to do this. Here's, here's what we're going to do. I, I need, it's pretty heavy. I think I'm going to need two people to hold it and one... <laughs> <laughs> and one person to throw it. And so I'm, I'm thinking, who might this be? I mean, is somebody, you know, that's strong and has, you know, just, you know, I'm like at least one good, you know, just like strong guy. Or we could let the guy throw and, and we have a, maybe his wife and daughter or something like that. Um, you like this, don't you? You like this. What, what Derek Lee's scared of is he goes, I got a wife and a daughter. <laughs> That's what, he, that's what he's thinking. But I actually was thinking, I was thinking more, uh, I was thinking more like maybe Mickey and Terry Titloff might help me with this. And then I'm sure that, I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that, there, come on up here. Come on, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I'm not scared of you, Emily. I should be. You're a teacher too. I should, okay, now this is going to be fun. Uh, so come on up here, you guys, and you guys give them a hand. This is really, really cool right here. Uh, I mean, I really enjoy this. Remember now, the, the definition of sin in the Bible would be missing the mark, okay? Uh, so here's what I'm thinking. Uh, ladies, let's let you hold this thing right here. <laughs> now, now, listen, Terry, these, these things are sharp, man. I mean, these things are... They're plastic, though. They're, you weren't supposed to say that. These things are... I've got one of those at home. You know what I'm thinking, though? You have one at home? Yeah. Well, then you don't get to throw. You're too good. Come here, Mickey. You get to throw at him. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so, so the question is whether or not... Now, the, the, I mean, just pick a color, any color. It doesn't really matter to me. Okay, but then, but then you're way too close. Let's get back over here. Okay. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. Now, <laughs> they're moving it. 
Okay, I think you're holding it too high. I think you need to hold it down a little bit. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. They're, they really are plastic. Nobody's going to get genuinely harmed. Maybe emotionally hurt. Maybe. So, th- this is your chance. This is your chance. If you want to do it, everybody would think it was an accident. Oh, okay. You could, you could get them good. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's try three, two, one. I don't have a sermon for when you break the dart. I don't understand how to do Let's try this again. I think you have to throw it a little harder. That's what it is. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> We're getting there. Okay. We're going to have to redefine the Greek word. Like, like. <laughs> it's stuck in the carpet. Okay, I'm going to let you take a step forward just for, yeah, there you go. We're getting there. Okay, is this a good visual for missing the mark or what? I mean, I totally chose the right people. There we go. Okay, this one has no feathers. That's going to be fun. Yeah. Throw it like a knife. Like, like. That's a little, that was my seat. Here, go, go for that. Go for that. Almost. Okay, now listen, crowd, I, when Miss Mickey hits this, when, when she does, I want you to erupt like somebody just got saved. You know what I mean? Like, I want you to have... Like, I mean, you got to really, you got to give her some motivation, okay? So come on, give her a little motivation right now. Almost. It's going to, if it doesn't stick, we're going to praise. Yes! <laughs> give them a hand, you guys. They did great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. I'm so, oh my, that's fun. So that was an experiment in missing the target. That's what that was uh, for us. Ultimately, remember now, that this, is, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a God who is holy. Now, you, you, I think the, the reason I wanted to bring this up is sometimes I think we forget what we're singing and we forget what we believe. And, and, and in some ways, that, that can really mess with who we you know, kind of think we are. The, the fact that God is holy means that he is the target and cannot and will not and never will put up with anything that misses the target. So when we say God is holy, that's not like a sweet and kind kind of comment that ought to make us feel all warm inside. Like you wouldn't put that phrase on a, on a coffee mug, you know, like for the morning, go, well, I feel so good today because God is holy. No, the fact that God is holy defines the problem Because in that, on the opposite side of the coffee mug, if we did, we have to write, and I'm not, right? God is holy, and I'm not holy. And so in the long run, what ends up happening is we have to remember that the the faith that we have and the the, the essence of who we are, the, the beginnings of the gospel or the good news that really ought to drive us is that, is that yes, God is holy, but that brings a problem because people aren't. Okay, people can be good, they can be nice, they can be kind-hearted, they can be neighborly, they can be all those things, but, but people aren't holy. Holy meaning perfect, separate, completely and totally uh, perfect in every way. We're just not, okay? We're not. And so when we sing that worship song, holiness, holiness is what I long for, holiness is what I need. See, the truth about that song is it's holiness, I'll never have it. Holiness, I just can't find. I'm like, like, it's not something I can go out and get, right? Not on my own. And so in the long run, what we have to realize is that when we begin the story with God is holy and everything we sing and all that we talk about and all that we think is all about how holy God is, we can't let that just make us feel sweet and kind and cuddly because the honest truth is God is holy and we're not. And that's a problem. That's the beginning of the good news story. I'm going to read to you Romans 3. I'm going to read 21 down to probably 25 or 26. Uh, On the back of your handout, if you grabbed one, the notes for today's message are there. Feel free to jot some things down. Keep that with you if you would like. Let me read to you from uh, Romans 3, 21. But now God has shown us a way to be made right. In other words, that means holy. God has shown us a way to become holy. God has showed us a way to become holy or made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. In other words, 
God has taught me a way to be holy without actually being holy, like without me actually doing it. God has taught me a way to get there without me getting there. That's, that's what he's saying. God has taught me a way now to be holy or made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, which side note should tell you that Christianity was not a, like a surprise plan B to God. God has been planning the redemption story of humanity through the Jewish faith, what we call the Old Testament, through the change that happened in Christ and his death, and through the church in the New Testament. This is all part of God's plan in us. In verse 22, it says, we are made holy, or we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for whoever believes, no matter who we are. Isn't that a really, really cool comment? In fact, I'd like you to read that out loud with me. Verse 22, off the screen, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Verse 23 says this, for everyone has sinned. By the way, that's a statement, that is not a statement of behavior, that is a statement of essence. That's not saying everybody made a bad choice. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying everybody did wrong stuff. That's not what he's saying. He's saying at the core of who we are, we're all broken. That's what he's saying. We are broken. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. That, that visual is the one we just saw of dart throwing. We all are the dart that doesn't make the target. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And then I love it. Yet God with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. There's a big difference between righteous and holy. We use those words interchangeably. They do not mean the same thing. Holy means that you completely, all on your own, are perfect. Okay? Only God is holy. Righteous means that the one who is holy said you're holy too. That's a difference. It's a difference between... Okay, let's say, anybody, you, anybody ever been to court, like face a judge? Don't raise your hand, I'm kidding. Like, like, okay, you know, got the charge standing before the judge. Okay, you know you did it, right? Like, you know you did. Like, like you're guilty, you're not holy. But when the judge drops his gavel and calls you innocent, then do you get arrested? No. So you're innocent by virtue of the fact that the judge said you're innocent. You're not innocent by the virtue of the fact that you didn't do it. Those are two different things, Right? So in that sense, God is holy, but we are righteous. God has made us right with him. He, gavel in hand, drops it and says, those in Christ are innocent. That should affect the way we view ourselves and the way we think about the gospel in the church. For everyone is sin, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. So there's this spiritual problem that the church must be engaged with. Everyone is broken. Everyone is lost. Everyone is sinful. Everyone is dying. That's a, that's a problem that we can't get away from because we live in America and not a third world country. That's a true reality for everyone on the planet everywhere. It doesn't matter how much money you make, whether or not you're from a good family, what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what you do for a living. Everyone is broken, lost, sinful, dying, all of us. Right? That's the beginning essence of the problem. But the spiritual solution, or God's solution, uh, we talked about was even though we have uh, even though we have missed the point or missed the target, the next thing is that God's good news solution is this: God cares, God has a plan. Jesus is meant for everyone. It's the part about it doesn't matter who you are, right? Jesus is meant for everyone. Jesus is sufficient. It doesn't matter how much you've sinned, how how far you feel like you missed, like. Like Miss Mickey was doing a great job of coming awfully close. The target was over there, but metaphorically in life, some of us are doing this, right? The target's over there, and we're just going over there. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are, 
or where your sin has been or how far you feel from God. Jesus is sufficient. The truth is today you can follow Christ. It doesn't matter from where you're following, you know, where you start. That's not the issue. The issue is that you can follow Christ. That is the essence of the good news that the church is about. Please don't ever let us in your own faith and your connection to your church, don't ever belittle the Christian faith by when somebody goes, what kind of church do you go, go to? Don't ever belittle your faith by going, I go to a casual church. No. I mean, I, I'm, I know, I get it. I'm in the jeans and I'm the casual guy. I love the casual. That, but that is so not what I'm about. The gospel is what we're about, Right? The gospel is, when somebody says, tell, tell, me about, tell me about that potter's house, it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to just be, man, that band is great, or wow, wow, that new preacher can bring it. And you, could, you could get to that point eventually. When I get to that point eventually, I will eventually get there. Uh, but when, when you do, th that's, not the, that's not the issue. The issue is, man, you know what? We are a group of people who want to help people meet Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's it. We, we want to help people meet Jesus. We want to help people connect with the... We want to help people not be dead anymore. We want to help people not be broken anymore. We want to help people not be lost anymore. We want to help people not be doomed anymore. Am I making sense here? Like, I think we want to make it hard to go to hell in Livingston County. That's what we want to do. Like, we want to help people connect with Christ. That's who we are. And, and all of that other stuff, ultimately, doesn't matter nearly as much as we think it does. That other stuff matters as a tool for how to do who we are. That, that, that's, that's secondary, not primary. So here's some thoughts, just some things I want to toss at you, some things we might consider as a church that wants to be gospel-focused, that wants to be concerned with God's good news. I'm going to bring two or three this morning and then some more tonight. Okay, so this is just a few things. Here are some things I've been thinking through this week. I, I put some of this on my website, theleadthechurch.com, and several of you and some others have made comment. Like, I just asked the question, what do you think about these thoughts? Are, are these helpful to you in your walk with God? And, and so there's nothing formal about these statements. These are just my words, but let me see if this makes sense. Uh, if a church wants to be gospel-focused, the church must believe that relationship is greater than religion. The relationship is greater than religion. We have to believe that. I mean, there's no, you can't ever come to the place where it's not. So here's, here's what I mean by that. Uh, that means that someone being connected to Jesus is more important than someone doing it the way we do it at church. Like someone being connected to Jesus is more important than someone fitting into all the guidelines and expectations that we might have of the normal churchgoer. Like relationship is more important. It's greater than religion. Now, here's the reality. You're going to have a hard time as a Christian convincing those who are disconnected from God that that's true because they think that we are very religious people, right? Some of you are in the room right now going, I kind of think everybody's very religious people. I know a lot of those I've gotten to know thought I was very, very religious. Here's what I mean by that. They thought that if ever I saw something I didn't like, it would make me frown automatically. You know, they thought I growled like an angry dog when someone did something that the Bible says not to do, right? Err. You know, they thought that, they thought that if, if I ever found out they were doing something they shouldn't do, it would just make me mad at them and I wouldn't like them anymore. Right? They, they, thought that, they thought that my beliefs were more important than my relationship. That's what they thought. And actually, as they begin to find out that that's not that that's not true, that's not at least not how I want to live my life, that all of a sudden a relationship with God is so much more attractive than a religion. Make sense? I mean, if you're just picking a religion, man, there are some fun ones out there, you know? If you're just picking a religion, a group of rules to live by, you know, or a, a, I don't even know that, you know, we, I don't even know that, Hear me carefully, don't tweet this wrong now, okay? If you're just pricking a religion, I don't know that we got the best one. I'm saying something that leads to nowhere and is a bunch of rules to follow in life, right? That's, that's ridiculous. That's not what we are. We are Christ followers, and we have a relationship with him. The scripture says this, 2 John 1, 9, anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God, but anyone who remains in the teachings of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. It's so interesting to realize that as Jesus takes the, the teachings and the relationship, and he says, following the teaching leads to the more important thing, which is the relationship, right? 
It's not the other way around. It's not the other way around. That's the first thing. The second thing is, so the church, if it wants to be gospel-focused and good news, it must believe. It must believe that story is greater than theory. Here's what I mean. Uh, story is greater than theory. Yesterday, some of you know my dad. I'm gonna, he's not here, so I'm going to pick on him. Yesterday, uh, I went and had a friend, and we went to his house, and we were going to move a piece of furniture from upstairs, downstairs. He called me. Mom actually called, and she goes, on your way to Paducah tonight, would you stop by and pick up this piece of furniture, take it downstairs? I think it's a one-man job. That's the quote. I think it's a one-man job. Now, I know my mom. She thinks I'm more of a man than I am, I think. And so I got another man, and I took him with me, right? So we dropped by. It's a chest. It's like a, it's like a chest of drawers. It's like Oh, oh, no, what is it? It's like, it's like, I'm sorry, it's a dresser. That's the correct word. It's, a dre- it's, like, it's like 11 feet long. You know, it weighs a ton. Like it's, no, it's not quite that big, but it's big. And, and she wants me to just, just one man job, just move it down the steps, okay? My dad walks in the room. My dad, after he stopped teaching, he ran a moving company in Paducah for about 12 years. And so he walked in the room and my dad went, I'm gonna give you my opinion. I said, never had a doubt. He looked at me like that, like, do you think I give my opinion often? And I said, yes, you do. You know? Uh, okay, there are a lot of us in, 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 in the Christian world who start with our theories. Right? You know what? Let me tell I'll tell you what I think about that. Right? I don't know if you know this or not, but when you tell somebody that, they, they shut you off right then. At that point. I'm not saying they're right to shut you off. I'm just saying they do, okay? I'm not, I, uh, let me tell you what I, I'll give you my opinion. Uh, you know what, you, what I did yesterday? Now, I, I'm all about honoring your father and mother, okay? But I'm near 40, right? Near it. I'm not there yet, as are many of you. Ha. I'm not there yet. I'm getting there. When it, ha- when it happens, I know it's going to be hard, and you're going to be mean, and I'll take it. But, so, I'm not there yet. I want to be respectful, but, but... But, you know, even I, I'm like, I'm like, don't tell me what, what to, like, don't tell me what to do, right? Don't tell, see, here's the difference. Story is greater than theory. Here's the story. Story is, you know, son, can we talk about that? Sure, let's talk about that. Okay, well, I've done this before. I, 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 when I went down the steps before, I made a mistake. And when I went down the steps with the furniture, made a mistake, I, I fell and I broke stuff and it was hard. And since that time, I've learned this lesson. And I think maybe the lesson that I've learned could help you because I messed up the first time. I don't want you to mess up this time. So can my failures help you to succeed? Uh, maybe you shouldn't do it the way you're about to do it. That's a story, right? I want to hear that story. I want to hear that story because I want to know about the time you failed. I do. I want to remember that, write it in a card on a birthday or something. Like, I want to do that. But in addition to that, now there's just something about the human heart that's a little more open to hearing the, the end of the story, which is the opinion, right? It's so much different than, let me tell you how to do that. Am I right? Anybody in the room just loves it when somebody points at you and says, let me tell you how to do that? No, none of us do. None of us do. We're such a quick culture. We like it fast. And our relationships have become microwavable to the point that we don't want to take the three extra minutes of time it takes to tell the story and build a case for why the opinion is helpful, okay? And in the long run, our opinions become harmful instead of helpful. And in the long run, our theories push people away from God instead of draw them close to him. And I get that our intention was always to help. But just because our intentions are to help doesn't mean we helped, right? So in a church that wants to be gospel-focused, we will choose to be, we have to be about the story. When you see somebody who needs to do something differently, don't just go to them and say, don't do it that way. Don't do that. Go to them and say, honey, I have done it that way so many times and it has broken me every time. Can I tell you about my own failure? Can I tell you about my own struggle? See, when you tell the story, when you tell the story, here's the deal. This is a huge thing for us as Christ followers. When you tell a story, instead of giving a theory, we don't get to come across like an expert. And we all love to come across like an expert, right? We, don't we? I mean, it just makes us feel good when we come across like an expert. I've done that for 20 years. I've raised three kids. I've done this other thing. I've got all, like, and, and so we love to just go, do it because I said do it. But, but nobody ever does it because we said do it. 
and it doesn't help. But when we get a chance to not be, not be the expert and just come into the conversation and say, hey, before you start that, can I, can I tell you a story? Or can I, can I tell you what happened when I tried to do that? In the long run, the person you're talking to listens and they care. And they may or may not do it your way. That's not the point. You've connected with them and helped them hear God's word or helped them hear a piece of truth. And it's been helpful and good. So the church must believe that story is greater than theory. Mark 4.2 says about Jesus that he taught them by telling them many stories in the form of parables. He taught them. Don't you know that Jesus, if anybody, gets to be the expert? Like if, if anybody gets to go, Simon Peter, you're a bonehead. Stop doing that and do it my way. Like, like Jesus could have done that. Paul would have written it in the Bible, right? And we would have had it here. But he never does. He never does. Like he, he tells stories and helps them come along and understand and discover what's going on and what he's teaching. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing about Christ. The next thing, and I'm about done here, is that if the church is about the gospel, then the church must believe that team is, is greater than individual. Team is greater than individual. So listen carefully, because this one could be misunderstood. Okay, listen carefully. I believe, as all of you, I'm sure, that the Bible teaches that our faith is personal in the sense that we make a private decision or a personal decision to follow Christ. But what we have to understand is that from the point of salvation or conversion or what, that beginning place, your faith is never private again. And for the rest of your walk with God, you're a part of a team. Does that make sense? And so here's the deal. We should, we should start to less like the phrase, God told me, and start asking the question, what has God told us? That's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. In every situation, and I've been, I, I know I'm very, very, very young, as I discussed earlier, but, but in that amount of time, I've been a pastor for 20-something years, and every time I've seen a person make a, like a great, big, major, bad decision, almost always this Christ follower was saying something like, God told me to do this. But they never ask anybody else. And in the long run, they diagnosed what they wanted to do or what felt right or what their flesh was leading them toward as God telling them something privately and personally. And if they had just sat down with one other believer and discussed it, somebody would have gone, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Don't, don't go into that. I don't know that that's healthy. They would say, let me tell you a story. <laughs> that's what they would say, right? Right? And so in the long run, uh, we begin to trust one another and our faith builds because of one another. And teamwork is always greater than individual in the Christ, in the Christian faith. Here's what Jesus says. Matthew 16, 18, a verse most of us have memorized. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. That's an individual. He's looking at an individual. I say to you that you are Peter, an individual. Upon this rock, I will build my church it, it, ecclesia, it means gathering. It means group. In other words, it's plural, okay? He says, I'm going to take the individual and the faith that comes from the individual on that, I'm going to build the plural. And it's the plural that the powers of hell will not defeat, right? Here's what the scripture does not say. The scripture does not say that Satan will never defeat you. There will be momentary losses. There will be battles fallen. There will be times when you feel just about spiritually broken. What the scripture does say is that, the, is that Satan will never defeat we. Never defeat us. Never defeat the group, the gathering, the plural, the together, the public faith, the, the corporate faith, not just the private faith. I don't know about you, in my life I have moments of near death where it looks like, it looks like Satan's going to win today. But the church is promised that it will always, always, always win. So this is a problem for us because for so many people, when they individually, privately feel like they're just about broken, what so many of us do is leave the church and run away from the one thing that promises that it won't be defeated, right? 
I would say to you, when you're at your lowest and most broken, when you feel ashamed, when you feel like you're struggling, when you feel alone, then being right in the middle of the people of God is right where you better go, right? It's like surrounding yourself with warriors who won't let Satan win on your behalf. That's where we go. Now, that takes a different way of looking at the church. If you look at the church as a place where everybody's good and perfect and right, and on the outside everybody's got it kind of painted just perfectly and we're all fine and all of that, then when you are broken and all alone and off by yourself, you won't want to go be with those people because you'll feel less than them. But if you recognize and realize, like we said in the gospel, that everybody's broken and everybody's lost without Jesus and everybody's in sin and everybody's struggling without Christ and everybody's as messed up as you are, when we recognize that that only because of what Jesus did in people's lives are they being redeemed. Only because of what Jesus did in people's lives are they being changed and being made mature and being made like him. Only because of Jesus. And so in that moment, wouldn't you go, I'm broken, I'm alone, I'm off by myself, I feel angry or frustrated or hurt or whatever. It's in that moment that you go, I want to go hang out with those people who Jesus is helping change. Not, I want to go hang out with those people who are better than me. It's a completely different way of thinking. I know that to a lot of folks, theology sounds boring, but the truth is what we believe affects how we behave. And what we think in here and in here about God will determine what we will do when we get put in a tough situation. I don't want us to ever miss the mark as a church. I don't want us to miss it. I don't want us to get down the road and go, man, we thought we were hitting it, but we weren't hitting it. We were missing it. I don't want to ever do that. We want to be a people who recognize the mark, aim, trust, and throw. And here's what happens. When we aim, trust, and throw, there is no guarantee that because of our strength or because of our ability or because of our wisdom, there's no, there's no guarantee that this dart goes where it's supposed to go in life. There's no guarantee at all. But when we are together with one another, and I've got me and you and others, in just a moment, the praise team and band are gonna join here to sing a song. I, I need you for this visual. For those of you singers in the praise team, would you come forward already? It's almost your time. See, when, when I just toss this all by myself and all alone and things, it, it might hit, it might not hit, right? But God has surrounded us with one another. And I might feel so far from God. You guys come on over here. We're going to do this. I might feel so far from God. Hold this for me if you would, Kent. We're not going to throw it at you. But come on up here, ladies. Stand between me and the dartboard if you don't matter. Just, just don't mind. Just right through there. Just right through there. And I might feel like I'm way over here and I'm all by myself, but I'm not because I'm a part of the church. I don't throw the dart anymore. I hand the dart. And it gets there because we're together. We're a family. And now, right in the board, it's there. Jesus says, Jesus says that uh, upon the rock of the faith that that Peter showed, I will build my church, my gathering, my people. And upon that rock, upon that group, upon that church, the gates of hell will never win. Let's pray together.